Nico Jenkins actually testified from the defense table. He could barely raise his hand to be sworn in because of the shooting on July 30th. He crossed racial, gender, and city boundaries to commit his murder. 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts one, four, seven. I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. We're tax officers. We're counting taxable people. May we enter your home? Natural and smiling, Carrere, with a gesture of his hand, points them in the direction of the house. Poignot, taken by surprise, brings out his police badge. The suspect does not react. The house is small and narrow. Once they settle into the living room, Poignot in turn asks Carrere for his identification. And smiling, pulls out a gun. Here are my papers, he shouts, and he shoots at the inspectors. Kaufman was born on January 19, 1962, to an affluent and devoutly Catholic family. She was raised in lower middle class St. Louis neighborhoods. Her father left by the time she was six, and her mother had once tried to give her and her two brothers away. Her father's desertion was the first of several formative events that her defense claims left her in need of the attention of the wrong kind of man. In the spring of her sophomore year, she smoked her first marijuana joint. She was married and a mother at 18. After a little more than a year, the marriage unraveled. She struggled to support her son Josh on the swing shift at the carburetor factory. She remained in this loveless, violent relationship for five years until she fled west. Sizing up her useless job, Kaufman decided to travel with a girlfriend and start over in Page, Arizona, where she planned to bring her son once she settled. Unfortunately, she repeated the same pattern she had before and fell into a relationship with a low-level drug dealer. After their car was stopped for running a red light in Barstow, California, police discovered a loaded handgun and methamphetamine in Kaufman's purse. She was released and the charges were later dismissed, but her boyfriend ended up spending six weeks in the local jail. Here, she would meet a man that would change her life forever, James Gregory Marlowe, her boyfriend's cellmate. At their apartment one day, Kaufman said the stranger showed up to tell her that her boyfriend had been moved to a different jail. It was Marlowe, who had just been released from jail, sparks flew and quickly they were in a relationship. Her new beau and their crime spree. James Gregory Marlowe was doing time for the theft of his sixth wife's car when Cynthia walked into his wasted life. Born in 1957, he had been a dedicated thief from age 10, committed to Folsom Prison in 1980 for a series of home invasions and knife point robberies. Marlowe served three years on that conviction, earning himself a reputation as the Folsom Wolf proudly wearing tattoos of the neo-Nazi Aryan Brotherhood. It was love at first sight for Cynthia and James, her boyfriend instantly forgotten when Marlowe hit the street and they left California together in June. Marlowe had relatives in the border south, and the couple began working their way through the family tree, sponging room and board where they could, ripping off any obvious valuables when they were finally asked to leave. In time, it reached the point where Marlowe's relatives could see them coming turning them away with angry words or pocket change, depending on the latest pigeon's mood. At last, they were reduced to sleeping in the woods, where Cynthia contracted head lice and James was forced to bathe in kerosene to rid himself of biting chiggers. Soon the new couple was kicking around high desert haunts, often indulging in injections of crystal methamphetamine. Eventually, they headed east for Kentucky and the start of a violent cross-country rampage. Kaufman and Marlowe were charged with the slaying of a Kentucky drug dealer. Marlowe told police he shot the dealer with Kaufman's help for $5,000. Because of the end penalty cases here, that case has not been pursued. Along the way, Kaufman and Marlowe were unofficially married atop a motorcycle during what people called a biker wedding. During numerous angry fits, Marlowe allegedly beat and bit Kaufman and hacked off her hair, which was crew-cut length at the time of her arrest. He always apologized and showered his girlfriend with affection. They eventually drifted back to California and hunt for easy prey. On the evening of October 11, 1986, 32-year-old Sandra Neary left her home in Costa Mesa, California to obtain some cash from the automatic teller machine at her bank. She never returned, though her car was found by police in a local parking lot. Two weeks later, on October 24, her strangled, decomposing corpse was found by hikers near Corona in Riverside County. Pamela Simmons, age 35, was reported missing in Bullhead City, Arizona on October 28. Her car was found abandoned near police headquarters, detectives theorizing that she had been snatched while drawing money from a curbside ATM. On November 7, 1986, 
Kaufman and Marlowe approached Karina Novis at the Redlands Mall in San Bernardino County and asked for a ride. At gunpoint, Novis was taken to the home of a friend of Marlowe, handcuffed and gagged, then physically exploited. Kaufman and Marlowe were convicted of strangling Novis, who was found buried face down in a Fontana field. Three days later, authorities allege, the pair rode in Novus's Honda to the Orange County coast, where they lived off her bank and credit cards and prowled beach towns for their next victim. On November 12, they found her, and the resemblance to Novus was striking. Linnell Murray, a Golden West college student with pretty brown hair and long red fingernails, was working part-time at a Huntington Beach dry cleaners, about to close up when Kaufman approached her alone. The pair robbed the business of cash and clothes, then forced Marie into the Honda and drove to the Huntington Beach Inn. There, she was physically exploited by Marlowe, beaten, blindfolded, and strangled with a towel, authorities say. A maid arriving to clean the room found her face down in a full bathtub. On November 14, after wiping the car clean of fingerprints and abandoning it in the Running Springs community in the San Bernardino Mountains, Kaufman and Marlowe were captured in Big Bear during a police dragnet. At their woodsy motel room, police found several of Murray's earrings, described in a police bulletin as possible trophies. Trial and Sentencing Marlowe and Kaufman were formally charged with the last slaying on November 17 and held over for trial without bond. If any further proof of guilt were needed, homicide investigators told the press that fingerprints from both defendants had been found inside Karina's car. and Kaufman had been linked to the Fontana Pawn Shop, where the victim's typewriter was pawned. Another 32 months would pass before the crazy couple went to trial, and in the meantime, they experienced a falling out, each blaming the other for their plight. Had she not been sent to Orange County to face the second slaying charge, Kaufman would have been the first woman on the row since Californians reinstated capital punishment 15 years ago. Maureen McDermott, a Los Angeles nurse convicted of ordering the slaying of her roommate, awaits appeals there alone. In order to win the fatal penalty he was seeking against Kaufman, 
Orange County Deputy District Attorney Robert C. Gannon Jr. needed to prove she was guilty of slaying with a special circumstance. In this case, slaying in the course of a burglary, physical exploitation, kidnapping, or robbery. But Gannon had to also show that Kaufman intended for Murray to pass, a legal requirement at the time of slayings that have been changed. It was established to prevent the fatal end of those who aid and abet a slaying. Gannon declined requests to be interviewed, but Haidt, the prosecutor for the first trial, said jurors believe that Kaufman wanted Novus gone. Haidt is quoted as saying, she's a very bright woman, she is very manipulative and very clever, and she reeked of sexuality. The jury could see that manipulation, and the women jurors were more against her than the men. She came off so much smarter than Marlowe, and the jury told me they didn't believe this guy sitting there was outsmarting her, out manipulating her. In jail, Kaufman passed the time in jail studying history. She had ambitions of a college degree and teaching fellow inmates. Each Sunday night, she called her mother and exchanged letters monthly with her son. He assumed she was in jail on drug charges, but one day she knew he would have to be told the truth. The couple's trial finally opened in San Bernardino County on July 18, 1989. The justices rejected claims by attorneys for Marlowe and Kaufman that their defenses were so mutually inconsistent it was an abuse of discretion for retired San Bernardino Superior Court Judge Don Turner, assigned to hear the case, not to grant separate trials. There was plenty of independent evidence against both defendants. Justice Catherine M. Werdegar wrote, Not only was there no misuse of discretion, but she also said the case against both defendants was so strong that any error would have been harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. Jurors apparently rejected Kaufman's testimony that she only went along with Marlowe because he had hit and threatened her, and she was afraid he would harm her son, then six years old. Kaufman, whose defense also included testimony by an expert on battered women syndrome, said Marlowe told her he was a white supremacist and destroyed blacks in prison. Marlowe denied on rebuttal that he had done or said he had done any such thing. Marlowe testified it was Kaufman's idea to slay Novus. All he wanted to do, he said, was steal her car and get her personal identification number so that he could get money from an ATM. Kaufman, he said, insisted on Novus being destroyed. Prosecutors presented testimony from police witnesses, as well as from a cellmate of Kaufman's, suggesting that both defendants had taken credit for the slayings. Both defendants were convicted across the board, and both were sentenced to their end on August 30. Cynthia Kaufman thus became the first woman sentenced to perish in California since that state restored capital punishment under a new statute in 1977. You've heard of organized crime families, those descendants through the years who keep it in the lineage and commit similar acts of terror, whether that be kidnapping, theft, violence, or slaying. But you have probably never heard of the Leverings, Nebraska's own unorganized crime family. The history of violence, the brutal crimes, and an interview where Jenkins confessed to the murders, then... Now, Kleiner, excuse me, Jenkins said he is innocent, but he confessed to the killings because he wanted to get, he could be excused for the rest of the hearing and uh, go back to Lincoln. That's where he's being housed in the prison system. The patriarch, Levi Levering, was an upstanding Native American tribal chief whose subsequent offspring produced some less than savory characters. Down the bloodline, they went with the crimes getting more horrific and more and more prevalent. Until the current generation, when Levi's great-great-grandson, Nico Jenkins, with the help of his mother, sister, cousin, and uncle, committed multiple criminal acts so heinous and vile, they were almost impossible to believe. Nico Jenkins' Crime Nico Allen Jenkins, born September 16, 1986, is an American spree assassin convicted of committing four slayings in Omaha, Nebraska, in August 2013. The slayings occurred within a month after he had been released from prison after serving ten and a half years of the 18 years to which he had been sentenced for a carjacking committed at age 15 and for charges committed in prison. On August 18, around 7 a.m., the body of Curtis Bradford was found outside a detached garage at 18th Street and Clark Street by a man returning home from a night shift at a convenience store. Investigators arrived to find two bullet wounds in Bradford's back. It was later revealed that Bradford and Jenkins had posed for a Facebook photo posted the day before. Bradford would be the only victim familiar to Jenkins. Jenkins' fourth and final victim, Andrea Kruger, was discovered on August 21 at about 2.15 a.m. by a deputy sheriff responding to a shots-fired call. Her body was found lying on the road with multiple 12-gauge shotgun wounds to the face, neck, and shoulder. 
Kruger had been returning home after a bartending shift. Surveillance footage showed her locking up earlier, and then at 6.30 that evening, Kruger's gold 2012 Chevrolet Traverse SUV was found abandoned 12 miles away in an alley. Later that week, a news conference was held by Douglas County Sheriff Tim Dunning, in which he stated, On July 30th, he crossed racial, gender, and city boundaries to commit his murders. That investigators believe the SUV had been abandoned roughly 2.5 hours after being stolen, and that a feeble attempt had been made at setting the vehicle's interior ablaze. On August 30, 2013, Jenkins was arrested on an unrelated terroristic threats charge. By then, the evidence against him had mounted. Investigators had the image of a female associate on surveillance footage at a local gun outlet buying the kind of distinctive ammunition that had been used to commit the slayings. But you're going to get everything that you're going to need to give her family closure. Uh, but I want you to understand something, and I'm going to say this very, not hearsay, but to say, like, okay, my religion, not no goose chase. This is the real deal right here, which, okay. which you people signed up for. It's okay. a high point. It's a high point. Lee is a high point right here. What kind of intelligence? Intelligence of when would be the best window of opportunity what roles to take in. You realize that one, right? So if you're coming from that crime scene, you can hit it straight out for straight out to four. Additional footage had been pulled from cameras along the route to Kruger's abandoned SUV. On the evening of September 3, Jenkins confessed to all four slayings during a rambling eight-hour interview. Jenkins told police that the acts were sacrifices to Apophis, a deity, in the ancient Egyptian religion. He was charged with four counts of slaying following the confession. Trial and Sentencing In handwritten letters dated November 3, 2013, submitted to the Omaha World Herald, prosecutors and a judge, Jenkins said he wished to plead guilty to all counts in the four slayings and that he would protect Apophis's kingdom with animalistic savage brutality. To the four murders by the defendant, it is therefore the sentence of this court as follows. At case class one felony, death. Count two use of a deadly weapon, firearm, to commit executive to all murder convictions at counts 1, 4, 7, and 10. Count 3, CR 13-2768. Count 1, murder in the first degree, a class 4 to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts 1, 4, 7. On February 19, 2014, Jenkins filed a federal lawsuit seeking $24.5 million from the state of Nebraska for wrongfully releasing him from prison. He stated that his claims of hearing voices from Apophis were repeatedly ignored. In the six-page handwritten filing, he stated that being kept in solitary confinement augmented his schizophrenia. He blamed corrections officials for the four slayings. Jenkins claimed that his problems were caused by mental illness and that he had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. The judge ordered a psychiatric evaluation and a psychiatrist concluded that Jenkins had an antisocial personality disorder and was faking psychotic symptoms. Jenkins was declared competent to stand trial after scoring 68 on an administered IQ test and the proceedings against Jenkins commenced. On his request, Jenkins was allowed to represent himself at trial under the guidance of advisory attorneys. Throughout the trial, Jenkins maintained that he acts under the command of Apophis. His courtroom antics included speaking in tongues, howling and laughing at prosecutors recounted the details of his victim's demise. You won't tell me what the heck happened out there. People are going to think the absolute worst. Everything went bad. If this someone panicked, if this did something really stupid, now's the time. Because otherwise, you're... I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. What do you mean? Sir. I got the weapon. I got Nico Jenkins. I already, you know, I know who, I know what, I know when, I know where. On April 16, 2014, Judge Peter Batalin found Nico Jenkins guilty of all four slayings. Jenkins was initially scheduled to be sentenced on August 11, 2014. The date was delayed indefinitely, following a hearing held to determine whether he was capable of understanding the capital punishment proceedings against him. On July 29, Judge Batalin ordered Jenkins to be housed at the Lincoln Regional Center Psychiatric Hospital until doctors were satisfied with his condition. 
Officials at the regional center refused to house Jenkins due to inadequate security, but doctors agreed to treat him at a Lincoln prison. In May 2017, Jenkins was sentenced to his end by a three-judge panel. He was also sentenced to 450 years on weapons charges connected with the slayings. On April 20, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear his appeal. The convict is at the Nebraska Correctional Facility and still on America's end row. Who were the Leverings and the Jenkins? That finding was reported in a package of stories that explored generations of crime and violence. This was more poignant because it marked an extraordinary fall from grace that began with a Native American ancestor, Levi Levering, who had been a distinguished tribal leader. He was the first Native American commissioner to the Presbyterian General Assembly in 1911 and successfully lobbied Congress in 1920 to protect tribal members' rights to their land. I will testify to that. This is the first time that I've ever even assisted law enforcement in my life. It's, it's golden. Any jury is not going to look at me and say, oh, he's told before and he's done. With my hitch, that woman's husband and children, that woman's husband is grieving right now. Killer that just wanted to go trophy. I'm documenting psychiatrically. The World Herald reported the following about this family. A name that was respected in Nebraska 100 years ago has become synonymous with lawlessness as generations of Leverings succumb to alcohol, drugs, and violence. Nico Jenkins, as a kid, had a difficult upbringing and struggled with mental illness from a young age. His family members have also reported a history of neglect and trauma, which may have influenced his subsequent actions. Mutilating his member happened a few months after a botched attempt to carve 666 onto his forehead. Since he wasn't looking into the mirror, Jenkins made a 999. But beyond his crime, who is he? Nico Jenkins' wife. Shalonda Jenkins married Nico Jenkins at Tecumseh State Prison on 6 February 2010. The two criminals were serving jail terms then. Nevertheless, they spent only four weeks as a couple outside the prison and had similar facial writings and drawings. Shalonda is usually linked with her husband's crimes, though not severely punished by him. She had a challenging childhood as she spent her teenage years in prison for various law infringements. At the same time, she has also been termed a famous face in correctional centers. Voice that came and was just like, if you do what I tell you, sorry for the, the victims. I feel sorry for all four of them. I feel sorry for people who got hurt to do. If you follow my demands, then I'll make sure you're safe and make sure you're okay. Or rather, he has to do life without parole or whatever. I just want my husband to get the mental help that he needs. The ex-wife of the Slayer has finished her one-year jail term in the Nebraska Women's Correctional Facility in New York. She is a free Omaha citizen, and there has been no report of her breaching the law. But before her eventual release, Shalonda Jenkins served a jail term thrice. In 2013, she was sentenced to one-year imprisonment as a suspected accomplice to her former husband in his spree of slayings in August. This was based on the fact that they had only been outside the prison for four weeks after their marriage. So loudly, deputies had to ask them to settle down, but Prosecutor Brenda Beadle says the judge didn't say well. I knew he wasn't guilty. I knew my son would have done nothing like that. Day one that Tony never in any kind of way would have done anything to assist Nico or any other one to commit a crime. Guns, short shotguns all the time in their pants. That's how they, they're not going to bring it in. Uh, and walk in the middle of a hotel with a shot thing to gain from telling the police what she saw that night and everything to lose. The verdict will affect Nico Jenkins' murder case. As for Anthony Wells, Douglas County Corrections tells me he won't be going home to... In addition, she was arrested in 2019 after the former girlfriend of her son's father reported she was kicking and screaming at her door. When the authorities saw her, she said her name was Shah Moore but was later identified by her car registration number. Another interesting character is Don Arguello from Lubbock, Texas. 2019 declared her undying love for Nico. She said she wanted to marry him. The 49-year-old woman reportedly became emotionally attached to him when volunteering for an inmate advocacy group. However, it is unknown if they actually had a relationship or if she was just a fan. Eugene Weedman became the last person to be destroyed by capital punishment before a crowd of spectators in France marking the end of a tradition of public punishment that had existed for a thousand years. Eugen Weidmann, a handsome German expat, hatched a plan. Weidmann decided that his previous career of petty theft had little room for advancement. Besides, he wasn't very good at it, 
having already spent five years in a small German prison. So he recruited two compatriots, rented a villa near Paris, and began kidnapping rich tourists for the sole purpose of stealing their money. Weedman proved about as good at kidnapping tourists as he was at petty theft. His first victim struggled, thwarting Weedman's plans. So the German and his compatriots decided to start slaughtering their targets. After all, lifeless men can't struggle. After the fifth or sixth body, Weedman was arrested. It was his slaying of the Brooklyn-born dancer Jean de Coven, which particularly captured the media's attention and turned his trial into a tabloid favorite. December 1937. The World's Fair closes. Some people benefit from this general chaos. The Cagular and the Popular Front clash. Everyone is on alert. 30 years old, very handsome, German. He's recently moved to Paris, and he wants to shine no matter what it takes. He'll be the last person to carry out the guillotine sentence in a public square. Weedman's final crime. Weedman was born in Frankfurt am Main to the family of an export businessman and went to school there. He was sent to live with his grandparents at the outbreak of World War I. During this time, he started stealing. Later in his 20s, he served five years in jail for robbery. During his time in jail, Weedman met three men who would later become his partners in crime, Roger Million, Blanc, and Fritz Frommer. After their release from jail, they decided to work together to kidnap rich tourists visiting France and steal their money. They rented a villa in St. Cloud near Paris for this purpose. Their first kidnap attempt ended in failure because their victims struggled too hard, forcing them to let go. Their second attempt at a New York dancer visiting France, Jean de Covin, was more successful. The relations between Jean de Covin, a professional dancer from Brooklyn, and Eugène Weedman, a practiced criminal from Frankfurt am Main, were merely social. Sociability with strangers was her personal weakness and his professional stock in trade. Impressed by the tall, handsome German, de Coven wrote to a friend, I have just met a charming German of keen intelligence who calls himself Siegfried. Perhaps I am going to another Wagnerian role. Who knows? I am going to visit him tomorrow at his villa in a beautiful place near a famous mansion that Napoleon gave Josephine. During their meeting, they smoked, and Siegfried gave her a glass of milk. De Coven took photos of Weedman with her new camera, later found beside her body, the developed film showed her assassin. Weedman then strangled and buried her in the villa's garden. She had 300 francs in cash and $430 in traveler's checks, which the group sent Million's mistress, Colette Tricot, to cash. The de Coven case started when her aunt received a telegram stating that all was well and not to worry. That evening a letter came mentioning Chicago gangster methods but assuring her that the girl was sound and safe, kidnapped, and held for ransom. The letter demanded $500 for the return of her niece. De Coven's brother Henry later came to France, offering a 10,000 franc reward from his father Abraham for information about the young woman. Arrest and Trial Officers from the region, led by a young inspector named Primborn, eventually tracked Weedman to the villa from a business card left at Les Aubres' office. Arriving at his home, Weedman found two officers waiting for him. Inviting them in, he then turned and fired three times at them with a pistol. Although they were unarmed, the wounded policemen managed to wrestle Weedman down, knocking him unconscious with a hammer that happened to be nearby. It's 2.30 p.m. on this Wednesday, December 8, 1937. Head Inspector Émile Bourquin and Agent Ange Poignon keep watch over a house called La Voulzy. We're tax officers. We're counting taxable people. May we enter your home? Natural and smiling, Carrère, with a gesture of his hand, points them in the direction of the house. Poignot, taken by surprise, brings out his police badge. The suspect does not react. The house is small and narrow. Once they settle into the living room, Poignot in turn asks Carrère for his identification, and smiling, pulls out a gun. Here are my papers, he shouts, and he shoots at the inspectors. In seconds, Carrère flipped from a calm man to a furious animal struggling with an incredible energy. Right. Weedman was a highly cooperative prisoner, confessing to all his slayings, including that of de Coven, the only one for which he expressed regret. He is reported to have said tearfully, she was gentle and unsuspecting. When I reached for her throat, she went down like a doll. He quickly confessed to the slayings of five other people, including three women, a man, and a child. He was charged with six counts of slaying and brought to trial in November 1937. The trial was presided over by Judge Henri Donadieu de Vabre and lasted for several days. 
Weidman's defense attorneys attempted to argue that he was mentally unstable and not responsible for his actions. However, the prosecution presented a strong case, complete with eyewitness testimony and physical evidence linking Weidman to the slayings. Weidman himself was unrepentant and showed no remorse throughout the trial. He even attempted to profit from his notoriety, selling autographs and posing for photographs with journalists. This behavior only served to further inflame public opinion against him. On December 17, 1937, Weidman was found guilty on all six counts of slaying and sentenced to his end by guillotine. Weidman's trial was perfect for the spectacle of headlines and the flashbulbs of 20th century cameras, a handsome assassin, a smitten showgirl, and a brief relationship before her grisly slaying. Colette wrote salacious scenes for the Paris Soir and Jean-Paul Sartre complained about the ceaseless coverage in his 1945 novel, L'Age de Raison. Perhaps ironically, Weidman's conviction was aided by the photograph when Coven's body had been discovered it was surrounded by recently developed snapshots of her assassin. After his arrest, Weidman's photograph was splashed across the front pages of nearly every newspaper. A Bertillon card and a snapshot of him immediately after arrest, his head bandaged from the struggle during his arrest. Once confirmed as a criminal, Weidman became a photograph where the specter of his impending doom haunted the images. Weidman's End Weidman was, of course, punished for his crimes with the capital punishment. The sentence was carried out in public on June 17, 1939, in front of the St. Pierre prison in Versailles. His punishment was originally scheduled for May 1939, but it was delayed due to a change in government and legal challenges by his defense team. Thousands of people had gathered to witness the punishment, including journalists, photographers, and curious onlookers. Weidman's behavior leading up to his punishment was unusual to say the least. He had become something of a media sensation, selling autographs and posing for photographs with journalists. He even tried to escape from prison twice, once by dressing up as a prison guard and once by digging a tunnel under his cell. The crowds that had watched his trial gathered for his passing, four hours in advance, reported the International Herald Tribune. 600 persons pressed towards the Place Louis Bartou. There were catcalls and jests with the mobile guard and occasionally a wave of cheering and whistling. In two brightly lighted cafes, waiters joked and perspired, and piles of sausage sandwiches, prepared in advance, went steadily down. A little after 4 a.m., Weedman emerged from his cell eyes, tightly shut, his face flushed and his cheeks sunken. His blue prison-issued shirt had already been cut away from his neck and shoulders. Weedman was placed in the waiting guillotine, his shoulders startlingly white against the dark, polished wood of the machine. As he was led to the guillotine, Weedman reportedly shouted, Gentlemen, I ask for your forgiveness. I am not guilty. However, his protests fell on deaf ears. Ten seconds later, he was gone. Weedman would probably have been forgotten and effervesced like all tabloid criminals if not for the intervention of technology. Unbeknownst to Parisian prison officials, a film camera had been set up in one of the apartments overlooking the Place Louis Bartou. The film recorded Weidman's passing, and by the next morning, photographic stills appeared on the cover of nearly every French newspaper. The Aftermath of the Incident Why was this to become the last public capital punishment in France? In the days following Weidman's end, the press expressed growing indignation at the way the crowd had behaved. A report in Paris Soir, published the day after the punishment but seemingly drafted in the heat of the moment, characterized the spectators as a disgusting and unruly crowd which was devouring sandwiches and jostling, clamoring, whistling. Before long, the government decreed the end of public capital punishments expressing its regret that such spectacles, which were intended to have a moralizing effect, instead seemed to produce practically the opposite results. Weidman went down in history as the last man in France to be guillotined for the entertainment of the awaiting crowd, a dubious distinction. The government did not find fault in the grisly punishment itself. Of course, it couldn't have. That would have been an admission of justice's guilt. Rather, it blamed the so-called unruly behavior of the savage crowd. The spectacle of bloodlust was, apparently, too powerful for the film. Public guillotining was hidden behind the confines of the prison wall, privatized to conceal the spectacle from the very technology that it had worked in concert with. Although spectators had been expressing their enthusiasm for, and snacking in the middle of, these performances for a very long time, what made this punishment different was the fact that it had been delayed beyond the usual twilight hour of dawn, and there had been sufficient light for several startlingly clear photographs to be taken. Photographs soon appeared in magazines across the world, including Match and Life. 
Worse still, from the authorities' point of view, someone had managed to capture the entire event on film. The photograph, once a friendly companion to the guillotine, had turned on its old friend. In unsympathetic hands, the photograph cast doubts on the actions of the guillotine. Its public consumption questioned a system of justice that was supposed to appear natural. The public passing of Eugène Weidman was a turning point in French history. The gruesome spectacle of a person being publicly punished by guillotine had long been a part of French culture. But the Weidman case helped to turn public opinion against capital punishment. The French government officially abolished capital punishment in 1981, and today, France is a vocal opponent of capital punishment worldwide. The end of Eugène Weidman also had a significant impact on the media. The sensational nature of his case and the public's fascination with him helped to create a template for how the media covers criminal trials and punishments. Today, the media plays an important role in shaping public opinion about crime and punishment, and the Weidman case is still studied by journalists and scholars as an example of the power of the media to shape public perception. That's all for today's video. See you all next time.